Hi, I'm Steven. My company is B Research, but uh, most of you probably know me as uh, Gamma Spectacular. Uh, I want to do a little uh, introduction video for the uh, Gamma Spectacular and the um, PRA software, but before I do so, I just want to cover a few basics uh, for the newcomers and beginners to gamma spectrometry, uh, so that it becomes less confusing. And those of you who are familiar with uh, gamma spectrometry can uh, just skip part this part and uh, go straight to the um, video instruction for the um, software. But um, for the beginners, uh, I assume uh, that you already know something about uh, radiation detection and that you probably have a Geiger counter or have at least played with a Geiger counter and know how that works. And um, what I want to cover here is the, uh, the difference between counting pulses with a Geiger counter and counting uh, pulses with a spectrometer. Now, typical uh, Geiger counters have a uh, steady pulse height. So in other words, they measure all radiation the same. So whether it is an X-ray, a gamma ray or a beta particle, the, the size of the pulse coming from a Geiger counter is almost identical. And that's because it works in a discharge mode where there's a gas discharge and uh, when, when the, gas, when the um, event, the, the gamma or X-ray event triggers the gas discharge, it outputs a pulse and resets itself. There's some dead time involved. And um, that's not particularly useful because what we're interested in measuring with gamma spectrometry is the amount of energy coming out of the nucleus. And let's face it, I mean, who, who would be interested in physics and not be fascinated by the uh, energy that comes directly from the nucleus and how it, how it uh, is generated inside the nucleus. And um, each, each uh, isotope has a unique signature. So the, the energy that comes from the, um, from the nucleus uh, during a decay of an isotope is unique to that isotope. And we can use that to identify the type of atom that the, that the gamma ray is coming from. So um, there is a couple of problems. There's a couple of problems with measuring um, gamma rays and that is uh, they are incredibly high energy which also means that they have incredibly short wavelength. The typical gamma ray is um, 10 to the minus 21 seconds long. Now that is a problem because we can't measure anything that fast, uh, even though we have modern electronics and uh, very uh, sophisticated equipment, uh, ten, minus 10 to the 21 um, uh, seconds is, uh, is very, very fast. So we need to do some things to slow down this gamma ray in order to technically measure it. So we go through a number of stages to do that. The, the typical method, and uh, I'm going to go through this because this is the most common method, is to use a scintillation detector. Now, a scintillation detector, which looks in its finished form like this, it's a cylinder, it's got some electronics inside, and usually a um, coaxial connector of some kind at the end. Um, but let's look at what's, uh, what's inside it. The first stage of the scintillation detector is a scintillation crystal. Now that is a crystal, or in this case, an organic plastic scintillator, which scintillates when a gamma ray goes through. So what happens here is the gamma ray interacts inside the crystal and gets absorbed by the crystal and interacts with a number of atoms in the scintillation material, which causes electrons to move from one shell to another and then output visible light. Okay, now the amount of visible light emitted by the crystal is proportional to the energy of the gamma ray that interacted with the crystal in the first place. Okay, so that's pretty clear. Now, essentially what this does, it changes the wavelength of the gamma ray from 10 to the minus 21 seconds to about 10 to the minus 15 seconds. Now that's a lot better, but still too fast to measure with our typical electronic equipment. So, introduce the photomultiply tube. Now the photomultiply tube has a photosensitive coating on the tube which releases electrons when it interacts with photons. So the photons that 
emanate from the crystal, interact with the photocathode, release electrons, which then go through 10 stages of multiplication and get multiplied by 10 to the 6 times and result in a small electronic pulse. Now this electronic pulse is in the order of 10 to the minus 6 seconds. Now we're getting close to something that we can actually measure. Now we take the, the pulse that comes from the photomultiply tube and we put it through a, an operational amplifier and a, and a coupling and slow down the pulse even more so that it is in the range of 10 to the minus 4 seconds. Now, now we're right down into the audio range and this is something that we can measure with an ordinary computer uh, and a sound card. And this is how sound card spectrometry works. So we've basically slowed down that high energy gamma ray um, right down into the audio spectrum but still keeping it proportional so that the higher energy gamma rays result in a proportionally a taller pulse in the in the audio range. To explain how we sample this, uh, this gamma ray or this uh, audio pulse uh, we need to look at some slides and I'll go through that now and show you how we digital how digital sampling works. So here we can see the uh, typical pulse which uh, is recorded by the sound card and here the black dots represent the digital samples at 2.6 microsecond intervals. Now as you can see some of the dots are in the positive region and some are in the negative region. So the rule with a pulse like this is that the total number of dots or the total number of samples always sum to zero. To avoid the problem of all the samples summing to zero, we simply square all the samples and take the root of the average. And this then gives us a positive number which is a representation of the energy of the pulse. Representing the uh, sample points as uh, bars on a bar chart makes it easier to see how we are summing the area under the curve to get a measure of the pulse energy. Right, so I uh, hope that was easy enough to follow. I did go a bit slow, but uh, the purpose is to make sure everybody can follow what I was saying and, and get an understanding of it because this might be new to some of you. Now a couple of things I just want to mention before I wrap it up here and that is uh, with the uh, sample rate. Uh, computers have different audio sampling rates. Um, this example was at 384 kilohertz. Uh, many uh, computers will uh, sample at 48 kilohertz or 96 kilohertz uh, and that will all work fine but generally the higher sample rates will give you a better result. Now uh, when it comes to the uh, energy representation here on the y-axis of the pulse, we generally divide the uh, total dynamic range of the sound card into 100 or into 200 from minus 100 to plus 100 but we generally operate in the 0 to 100 range for the pulse height. So this is something you will see in the software and later on when we have uh, set up our software and taken our first gamma spectrum we can look at the calibration process where we then convert the arbitrary units into actual gamma energy as in kilo electron volts or mega electron volts and so on. So uh, follow on for the next video and uh, we'll go through the hardware and then finally the software and then uh, finally the uh, calibration process. So see you there.